The Via Flaminia was built in the 3rd century BCE by Gaius Flaminius. It runs north out of Rome and crosses the Tiber at the famous Milvian Bridge before heading north by northeast and ending at Ariminum on the Adriatic coast, only about 30 miles from Ravenna. In the spring of 538, it served, more or less, as the border between Italian lands that were held by the Eastern Roman Empire and those held by the Ostrogothic Kingdom. Anything to the west was generally still under Vitiges, while anything to the east was generally held by Belisarius. The Roman garrisons in Narni, Spoleto, and Perugia were especially effective as they forced Vitiges and his Ostrogothic army to take a more indirect route back north after breaking off the siege of Rome in 538. At the north end of the Via Flaminia, Ariminum was occupied by a Roman force of about 2,000 cavalry under John, who apparently had a very strong reputation before the Gothic War. We don't have too much on his life before this conflict, but Procopius makes it clear that he was a very skilled and successful commander before arriving in Italy. John not only held Ariminum, but had also conducted raids on the surrounding area, capturing Ostrogothic women and children and forcing them into slavery. Many of these prisoners were the wives and children of the men who had just failed to breach Rome's walls. Because of this, Ariminum and John were major targets for the Ostrogoths. Belisarius knew this, and he sent infantry under Illiger and Martinus to relieve John. The city did not have enough supplies to withstand a long siege, and a smaller infantry force would be able to hold out much longer than John's cavalry. Belisarius also hoped that placing lesser officers in Ariminum would make Vitiges think twice about undertaking the siege. The chance to defeat John and the elite cavalry that he had with him would be very tempting. But, Belisarius thought, maybe Vitiges would go straight to Ravenna and regroup there if there wasn't anyone notable defending the city, thinking that it just wasn't worth the effort. There was just one problem. John didn't want to leave. So he just stayed in Ariminum, ignoring a direct order from Belisarius. Just brilliant stuff. Ildiger and Martinus moved back south to regroup with Belisarius, and John remained in the city, waiting for Vitiges. And when the Ostrogoths arrived, they initiated a siege. During the Siege of Rome, Vitiges had ordered large towers constructed, and these towers were pulled towards the city by oxen. That plan had failed miserably. Vitiges, though, didn't give up on it. He ordered another tower built, but this time, he would simply ditch the oxen and have his own soldiers inside pushing the apparatus towards the walls. On the night the tower was complete, the Ostrogoths went to sleep, expecting to take the city the next morning. But when they awoke, they noticed that the Romans had spent the night digging a massive trench in the tower's path. Vitiges was infuriated when he saw this, and the guards who had slept through the entire night were executed for their failure. The plan would go forward, though. He ordered the trench filled with whatever debris his men could find. Trees, branches, discarded arrows, stones, dirt, anything. He just wanted the hole filled up. And then, he ordered the tower moved forward. But when the wheels hit the trench, the filling collapsed under the weight, and the wheels got stuck. The Ostrogoths tried to pull the tower back to their camp, but the Romans flooded out of the city and launched an attack. The two sides fought until nightfall, with the Ostrogoths taking heavy casualties 
while succeeding to pull the tower back behind their lines. But their losses were significant enough that Vitigis decided against further assaults on the walls and chose instead to starve the enemy out. While Vitigis was assaulting Ariminum, Belisarius was surgically picking apart the Ostrogothic-held territories. He sent units by boat to Genoa, with the goal of moving them into Mediolanum, a northern city which had requested to join the Romans. He attacked the Ostrogothic garrisons at Tudera and Clusium, and brought those towns under his control. He was methodically pushing the Ostrogoths further back, while minimizing his own losses. It was a slow but effective strategy. As he moved northwards, another 7,000 men arrived in Italy under the command of Narses. You might remember Narses as the guy that bribed the Blues during the Nika riots. When this fresh batch of soldiers arrived, the Roman officers met in Firmum to discuss the plan of attack. Among those who attended this meeting were Belisarius, Narses, Ildiger, Martinus, Justinius, Aradius, and Narses. Yes, there is a second guy named Narses, because of course there is. The two men do not appear to be related, but this Narses was the brother of Aradius. The elder Narses, the man who held superior rank, is often called Narses the Eunuch because, well, I, I think that's self-explanatory. Anyway, the discussion at this council quickly turned to Eriminum with Narses, that's Narses the Eunuch, fearing that Belisarius would just leave John out to dry. Narses and the men in his camp wanted to head out quickly, relieve John, and engage Vitiges in a large, decisive battle. Belisarius, hoping John could hold out a little longer, favored a more conservative approach, securing towns, and continuing to squeeze the Ostrogoths. Imagine how Belisarius must have felt here. He had won a great victory in Africa. He had conquered half of Italy. While defending Rome, he had taken Vitiges' best punch, and he was still standing strong. And now, with the enemy on the run and the war seemingly nearing an end, he has a subordinate ignoring his orders, and this old man from Constantinople clearly working on behalf of Justinian, trying to shake things up. This could not have been easy to deal with. The issue was decided when a messenger from Ariminum arrived with a letter from John informing Belisarius that they did not have enough supplies to hold out much longer. The defenders would have to surrender within one week. Belisarius was left with little choice. He would need to immediately ride to the defense of John. And so he concocted a brilliant strategy to break the siege. He ordered Martinus to move his men up the coast towards the city. At the same time, Ildiger would sail just off the coast and approach by sea. And Belisarius would personally lead a third army, loop northwards, and threatened to separate the Ostrogoths from Ravenna. As Belisarius's men approached from the north, they encountered a small company of Ostrogothic soldiers. Some arrows were exchanged between the two armies, and then the Ostrogoths retreated back to their camp, reporting that Belisarius was personally leading an assault from the north. Vitiges began to prepare for Belisarius's attack, fearing that he must have a massive force with him. And that night, the Ostrogoths noticed the campfires from Martinus's men in the east. Belisarius had ordered these men to light more campfires than were necessary, in the hopes that it would trick Vitiges 
into thinking that the Romans had a larger army than they actually did. And this plan worked perfectly. The Ostrogoths began to panic, fearing huge armies about to surround them. The next morning, they saw Roman ships approaching the harbor. Ildiger's men. And this was the final straw. The Ostrogoths began to flee, and little by little, the entire siege broke down. They fled it to Ravenna, leaving Ariminum to the Romans. Ildiger's men landed and were the first to approach the city, chasing off or killing whatever Ostrogoths remained. Belisarius had won the day, yet again, and gave credit to his sub-commanders. But John... John didn't see it that way. He had heard about the discussion that took place at Firmum, and when Belisarius told John that he owed a debt to Ildiger for arriving first and clearing the final attackers away, John told him flatly that he did not owe Ildiger, or Belisarius for that matter, a single thing. He instead gave all the credit for the victory to Narses. Militarily, the Romans had seen nothing but success in Italy up to this point. But now, a rift was growing within their ranks. Belisarius was not only fighting for control of Italy, he was also struggling for authority over his own army. <laughs>